The Fall I was visiting my family in Pennsylvania the first week of October. It's been several years since I've been there in the fall. Late September, early October was always my favorite time of the year growing up. Lots of fond memories hiking and biking the Appalachian Trail, the sight of the colorful leaves changing and the smell in the air that time of year right before the leaves fall, especially the awakening of the olfactory memories combined with the beatific smile of the family dog, what more could you ask for to warm the heart? Earlier this year, summertime, my mother shared with me that she had heard that Peter, a friend from the church I was raised in, had recently completed his PhD in philosophy. At the time, she hadn't received his contact information, but she relayed to the woman from the church who shared the news with my mother that I would be interested in reading his dissertation. One of the first things my mother said to me when I was first sitting in the living room after my father had driven me from the airport, while the dog was performing somersaults, handstands, and various other feats of calisthenics that only a dog can pull off in greeting, was that she had heard from Peter and that he wanted to speak on the phone first to share a few thoughts on his dissertation before I started to read it. I told my mother that sounds wonderful. I hadn't heard from Peter for the better part of 20 years. While I was in high school, Peter was serving as a missionary in Africa, and when he returned from his missions trip, he attended the church I was raised in. When I was 18, Peter was in his early 30s, but despite the age gap, I felt something of a vague, psychic bond between Peter and his wife, Cheryl. In hindsight, I recognize it as the Holy Spirit embodied as a living testimony. There is no better evidence for divinity than witnessing it moving through another human being, and in Peter and Cheryl's case, it was always conspicuous, and that sticks with a person. That memory seared itself permanently into my brain, for which I am eternally grateful. Needless to say, I was looking forward with enthusiasm to hearing from Peter again, and for the opportunity to read his dissertation. When he first shared with me the subject of his dissertation, the study of a thorny theological mystery from the Apostle Paul's epistle to the Romans, where Paul asks, Why do I do the things I hate, and why don't I do the things I love? I knew I was in for a treat. I conveyed as much to Peter, and told him once I returned from a trip to the Big Island of Hawaii for the Ironman Championship race, I'd read his dissertation. A few weeks before visiting my family in Pennsylvania that first week of October, while doing my laundry and grocery shopping, I was perusing the Leave a Book, Take a Book kiosk library just outside the laundromat. I always take a peek at the titles while doing my laundry. This time, I came across a slim volume titled The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino. For a brief second, I thought, isn't the greatest salesman in the world the Apostle Paul? Where did I hear that before? Maybe two or three times. In a newspaper op-ed piece, on the TV, wherever, from whomever, the association with the Apostle Paul being the greatest salesman in the world wasn't a new idea. But at the time, browsing the leave a book, take a book kiosk library, the notion fluttered through my head for a moment and just as quickly left. I took the slim volume with me and there it sat on my bookshelf until the auspicious moment the thing chose to wink or nod at me. Whenever that would be, these things are out of my hands. For the time, I paid it no other thought. After returning from Hawaii, in the evening of the 22nd of October, I started reading Peter's dissertation. Thirty-five pages into it, and I felt a presence emanating from the text. While Peter was setting the stage with an historical perspective by mapping the genealogy of how definitions and meanings of words change over the course of history, and how those changes have profound effects on how we in the present age interpret language from antiquity, I couldn't help but feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. It was clear from the get-go that Peter's dissertation would prove to be a tremendous achievement in scholarship. But what also impressed me that first night was the interstitial message in the text. It went well beyond the absence of editorializing or making even the slightest judgments on the material being studied. There is a loving warmth permeating the erudition, 
throughout the entire narrative, and that was evident from the very beginning. Upon finishing reading the dissertation, I shared my thoughts with Peter, which are more or less summarized in the above paragraph. He's expanding his thesis into a book for the general reader, which will be a wonderful companion piece to the dissertation. I can't wait to read it. I finished reading Peter's dissertation on the 31st of October. The next evening, after settling in for the night, I picked up The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino. Being such a physically slight little thing, it appeared to be something that could be read in two or three hours. I picked it up and breezed through it before bedtime. It was an exquisitely told story of the wealthiest merchant in first century Palestine who had reached old age and decided it was time to settle his accounts and leave the business world. He had one item of business to attend to after liquidating the rest of his assets, and that was to discover to whom he was to bestow the ten scrolls which contained the ancient wisdom which taught him not only how to become the greatest salesman in the world, but how to become his very best self. As a young man starting out in life, the wealthiest merchant in first century Palestine was commissioned by his benefactor with selling a red robe made by the finest robe maker in all the land. His benefactor had a fixed value in silver for which the young man would be indebted to him once he returned from the marketplace after selling the red robe. However much the price he fetched exceeded the fixed value his benefactor placed on the red robe, the young man would be allowed to keep as his profit. As the young man begins his treacherous walk into the marketplace, with all the good faith in the world to prove to his benefactor he is possessed of the necessary skills and talents to become the budding capitalist he so desperately wishes to be, he crosses paths with a young man and woman with an infant child wrapped in a threadbare blanket. His heart is overcome with compassion for the three of them, and he quickly removes the threadbare blanket and replaces it with the red robe, free of charge. Upon returning to his benefactor with no small measure of guilt and shame, he relates what happened with the expectation to be met with scorn and condemnation from his benefactor. To his surprise, that is not the case. His benefactor listens to the telling of his story and decides that he is worthy of something of incalculable value. The ten scrolls containing the ancient wisdom which illuminated his life and paved the way to all his success in life, to whom his own benefactor had bestowed on him with the sworn promise that when the time came in his life to pass on this priceless wisdom, there would be one and only one person to pass this wisdom on to. So in each successive chain in the lifetime of the guardians of the ten scrolls, there would only be one in possession, in possession of the scrolls, and the young budding capitalist was the next in line. So despite proving himself to be woefully inept at red robe sales, his benefactor finds him worthy of guardianship of the ten scrolls with their ancient wisdom contained therein. After a prosperous life which exceeded all his expectations for it, now old age has come via merciless time, and the once young budding capitalist is the wizened, wealthiest merchant in all the land of first century Palestine, with one final commission of his own to accomplish, and that is recognizing to whom he is to bestow the ten scrolls. As the narrative is winding its way to an end, a young man enters his home. The young man shares with him that the names of the man and woman to whom he once gave the red robe were Joseph and Mary, and the infant child's name was Jesus. The man's name was Paul, he had a commission of his own to fulfill, and the wealthiest merchant in all of first century Palestine had no further mysteries to unravel. At this point I put the book down and stared into space. What are the odds? I asked. I had no preconceived thoughts on what this short narrative would be about. After the fleeting association with the Apostle Paul being the greatest salesman in the world, the first time I glanced at the book's title while doing my laundry and grocery shopping, I didn't give it a second thought. I casually took it home with me and forgot about it on my bookshelf. Then here, the very next day after finishing reading my, Peter, my friend Peter's dissertation on the Apostle Paul, I just so happened to decide to read a book 
which not until the very last chapter of that book is it revealed to be about the Apostle Paul. I was expecting some secrets on how to play successful Jedi mind tricks to sell the most cars or vacuum cleaners it's humanly possible to do until one says, screw this, I'm going to do something else with my life. It became clear after the first couple pages the story wasn't about cars or vacuum cleaners. But not for a second did any intimation hint to me the story would finish with the Apostle Paul until the Apostle Paul made his grand appearance. The air and the waters and the land didn't rearrange themselves in the firmament. Misplaced car keys didn't magically present themselves to the visible eye again. But something happened. Something far from ordinary happened. A week later, after the events of the following day, I was sure the Akashic Records had opened briefly and permitted me a peek inside. Everything that has happened is happening and will happen burnished on the face of eternity, existing always and forever. I've had that impression before. What a glorious and terrifying conception of one aspect of God. The infinite and eternal and indestructible word transmuted onto the stage of existence, forever and always, existing in eternity. Then I thought to myself, Luke, get a hold of yourself. Two events of extraordinary coincidence, which no doubt hold a deeper, greater significance, have occurred, but drawing conclusions as to what that significance is should be postponed. Give the miracle of life some more time to reveal its inner intentions. So the next day I'm at the library, picking out five movies at random, whatever catches my eye on the bookshelves. The first movie I pick is titled Serenity, starring Matthew McConaughey, and Anne Hathaway. It's about a boy who wants his father to kill his stepdad. Matthew McConaughey plays a fishing boat captain in what appears to be somewhere in the Caribbean. However, the island upon which all the characters find themselves is shrouded in mystery. No one knows how long they've been there, what brought them there in the first place. Nothing is as it seems, and everyone exists in a quagmire of uncertainty. As the movie progresses, it's revealed that the island and its inhabitants are inside a virtual simulation game being played by the boy on his computer. As simulation theory posits, in less than 50 years, since the days of Pong, where you had two sticks hitting a ball back and forth, to today, where we have virtual reality arcades that are on the cusp of creating artificial worlds where the experience is hardly indistinguishable to our perception of what we call everyday reality, which whatever the hell that exactly is, is a whole other story. But nevertheless, I digress. The point is, if you consider the arc of where simulation games were in the 1970s to where they are today, it takes a very small leap in imagination to see where this is headed. There will in all probability come a day in the not too distant future where we are creators of artificial worlds indistinguishable to human perception from the real world and accessible to anyone willing to enter them or unwillingly. It takes that small, that same small leap in imagination to foresee the possibility of untold virtual reality hells being created by nefarious unmentionables. Anne Frank said people are essentially good, so that probably won't happen. It gives one pause. Simulation theory is the creation story, with humans playing God. Never have I seen it shown so beautifully, with moving images before watching the movie Serenity. I don't know the director's intentions, whether the creation allegory interwoven into simulation theory as portrayed in the movie was implied or merely apparent, but to anyone whose eyes are awake to see it, the message shined through like an ocean full of diamonds. There was a scene towards the end of the movie where the father and son are reunited, and it was done with such breathtaking love and beauty that I cried. For a moment I saw the creation of Adam from the Sistine Chapel flash before my eyes. Weeping tears of joy, I started laughing the laughter of joy. The mellifluous voice of Alan Watts held forth, the universe is the cosmic self playing a game of hide-and-seek within creation. 
And then I thought, how simple yet elusive it all is. The fall of man, the garden of Eden, the artifice of the devil, convincing man of his separateness apart from God, the subterfuge of ego, the illusion that the parts exist in and of themselves, removed from the whole, that infinite and eternal consciousness, permeating all of existence, has a personality and wants nothing more than to know us, for the parts to know the whole, residing in love, in communion, that is the great commandment, for God is love and wants nothing more than for us to recognize this eternal truth. There is a very simple yet profound truth at the heart of the essence of life, hiding in plain sight because it is everywhere. This schism cuts to the very quick of existence. This broken union between creation and creator is the crux of the story of life. It reverberates up, out, and through all the dimensions. God is everywhere and everything. God is life. God is love. God wants to know us more than anything. However, his nature is immutable. Nothing can change God's nature. Yet God created us in his likeness. Each and every one of us has, to some extent, part of God's nature. We are all, to some extent, expressions of God's nature, for it's impossible for us not to be. Nothing can be created without reflecting aspects of its creator let alone the original creator-creation relationship. As the prophet Isaiah once said, I, the Lord, create the light. I, the Lord, create the darkness. I create all good and all evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Every gosh darn tooting thing in existence is inextricably connected to everything else. The universe is a single, cohesive, living, breathing, intelligent organism. Trees respond to the sound recordings of running water. Plants respond to the sound recordings of caterpillars chewing on leaves. Nothing is created in a vacuum, and nothing can exist without bearing some relationship to that vibrationless source residing at the heart of existence. It's like God is a merry prankster. This cosmic game of hide-and-seek probably has its own code written into the fabric of quarks, allowing them to pop in and out of existence. A wink and a nod from the big you-know-who. I almost think he's doing it as a cosmic joke. And after all, he can't help himself, because he can't escape his nature any more than we can. Creation is an inevitability. The act of creation is the very nature of God, the very nature of the universe. God had no choice in the matter either. God didn't choose to create the creation. Creation is who God is, for his nature is forever immutable. It's so simple yet so elusive. After finishing the movie Serenity, the veil of Maya vanished and I heard a silent voice say, Here I am. I'm right here. Not over there, but right here. There's nowhere else to go but right here. It's all around you, and it's everything. Open your heart. Open your mind. Open your heart and mind to me. November 2019